or tape, CDs, DVDs to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Tuesday afternoon, July the 2nd, 1991. Fourth of July family camp meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Steve Bell is the minister of the afternoon. It's really a privilege to have Linda and Steve with us. Uh, we were down to their place a few weeks ago with the Hammonds, and we just had a wonderful time of deliverance, kicking the devil out down there. And he's come up here now to help kicking out, kick, kick him out up here. And I guess Linda was doing a good job with Irma and them upstairs this afternoon already. They got a head start on you. Well, it's good to be back. It's been a while since we've been here. But I was sitting here thinking, first of all, and I've talked about what steady, constant friends Lynn and Irma have been to us during the years. Almost hard to believe. And then I got to thinking, I'm probably as much a, a son out of this place as anybody is. Because my roots are here. Our spiritual roots are here. I got my first livers right over there on the floor. When Willie sat on me, boy, I didn't get up. <laughs> right over against that wall, Frank Hammond laid hands on me. December of 1978. And uh, he's like a father to me in the gospel. I told him that a few weeks ago. We did a meeting in El Paso, a glorious meeting in El Paso. And uh, I sat down and said, Brother Frank, you know, you realize that I'm a son to you in the gospel. I thank God for all that he's done in my life after those years as a Baptist. And uh, since we've gotten here, the Lord's really been speaking to me. Let's take our Bibles, turn to the 30th chapter of Deuteronomy, and let's pray for a minute. And then I'm going to try to yield myself to the Holy Spirit. The Lord spoke to me on the way here that it, what he was going to do with us. But if you can receive this, there'll be a mighty deliverance for us here today. Now, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, for this place. We know your eye and your hand place. That you've set this place apart, Father. And that you're prepared in these end times for what you have here. That this is a stronghold, a storehouse. Lord, even a city of refuge for people. We thank you now, Father, that as we come forth with the word that we slay the enemy, Lord God, be true and accurate, and that, Father, there be deliverance, there be healing. Lord God, we pray. And know that without you we can do nothing. Thank you, Father, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for teachable ears, understanding hearts, eyes that see. God, open us up. We we bind the spirits of deafness and dullness and death. I bind the spirit of death in the name of Jesus. I bind death and hell. I bind every hindering spirit. I bind the strong man and everyone in this building and on these grounds and one, even those that shall come upon the grounds while we're here. In the name of Jesus. We bind the principality and powers of this area. And if you have no part in this matter, we declare it so. We thank you for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ today. Thank you, Lord, that we overcome him by that blood, by the word of our testimony, and that by willing to lay down our lives, even unto death. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. In the book of Deuteronomy, in the 30th chapter, the book of remembrance where Moses called the children of Israel to remember all the things that God has done. It's a book that's close to my heart because of what God has opened up to set us free of curses. But there in the latter passage of that 30th chapter, there's some uh, words there that Moses speaks through the inspiration of the Lord. Beginning in verse 15, the Lord is speaking through this servant, and he says, See, I've set before you today life and good, death and evil, 
in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, and to keep His commandments, His statutes, and His judgments, that you may live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go in to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. And I might add, even in the land that you've been given to possess. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. Now, here's the key verse. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, life, that both you and your descendants may live. I'm going to stop there. We've learned about curses. Many of us have. Some of you may not have yet. It's one of the basic, really, things of deliverance is to learn that curses still operate and that unless we break them, unless we can break them, that they will continue to operate in our lives. They don't just dissolve. They must be dealt with. But the Lord has begun to show me, has shown me that there's something more subtle and destructive than the curse. The curse can be something very obvious. You can see it operating. You can begin to see patterns in your life and see that something's wrong. I'm a believer, and yet this keeps happening. What's wrong? Usually it's a curse that needs to be broken because of ancestral sin or maybe my own sin. But there's another aspect that we find in this passage and because of its hiddenness and subtlety, it's hard to see. I need to lay a little groundwork before I go into this. First, I find again and again that we're still confused about how we're made. I hear teaching and preaching all the time on the makeup of man. And I propose to you today that I've discovered in these last years of ministry that one of the reasons a lot of people do not understand deliverance and can't receive it because they do not understand the makeup of man as presented in the Bible. Not in psychology, not in theology, but in the Scriptures. And I've decided that I must stay with the Scriptures in these regards, and as I do, I get a clarity of how a Christian can have a demon. Now, go back to Genesis the second chapter, and you probably know most of this by heart. But in Genesis 2, verse 7, God is saying, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man, it says in my New King James Version, man became a living being. But another word here is a living what? Soul. God made us primarily to be souls. And in that soul that we are is our personality. Through that soul that we are, we express a uniqueness that makes us all individuals. Now, the Bible talks about us having a spirit and dwelling in a body which is the temple of that spirit. But Jesus emphasized to the disciples after he arose from the dead, I am not a spirit. Touch me and see, for a spirit cannot have flesh and bone. That's out of the words of the Lord. Now, you say, well, what's that got to do? I hear it taught all the time, we are spirit, we are spirit. We have a spirit, we are moving more into the spirit realm, but the greatest promise we have of inheritance is to have a glorified body. And only a soul can operate a body. Now, spirits can influence, but that's our uniqueness, is that we're a soul. Now, this soul and this body was made to be a container to express spirits. And one of the things we don't understand, that we are built by God to be able to express spirit. That's our highest ability, because God is spirit. He created us and built us that we might be the best 
expression of who and what he is in all of the universe. And the enemy knows that, and he's taken advantage of that and come in and has sought to express himself through us. And so, in general, most of us are a mixture as believers. Once we become believers, we become a mixture. We're able to express the Spirit of God, yet at the same time, out of that same fountain will come bitter water that has just brought forth the sweet waters of Zion. It's awesome. My brethren, these things ought not to be so, James said, but nonetheless they are. And so deliverance comes in to begin to cleanse the water. And it gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by, hopefully. Praise the Lord. Now, Genesis 2.17. But the tree, God said to Adam, of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Genesis 3, 4. It's not God talking to Adam, it's the serpent talking to Eve. Adam evidently had done his ministry as head of the home. He transferred to this wife of his the word of the Lord. Honey, the, the Lord came to me and said that we're not to eat of this tree. Because the day we eat of it, we shall surely die. The serpent comes here in Genesis 3, 4, and he says to the woman, you shall not surely die. He's a liar. If we just learned that, we'd be half free. People come up to me all the time and say, Brother Bell, Satan said. The devil told me. I said, well, he's a liar. <laughs> So what he told you is just the opposite of what it is. We just learned that much. <laughs> We'd be 85% home. But we can't seem to get that, can we? Now, we know what happened there. After they ate, and the Bible says they died. But did they die? They didn't, they didn't die, as we know die. So evidently, God's definition of dying and death is different than our general definition, that when you die, boy, we put you in a casket, and we bury you, and we buy you some flowers, and so forth. So we need to come to the Scriptures and see what that definition is. How did Adam die? Okay. And we're back to body, soul, and spirit. His body didn't die. His soul didn't die. What happened? Something happened spiritually to Adam. And God said what happened to Adam was death. Are you with me? All right. Now. Go to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, and we'll begin to delve into this. 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to read verse uh, 20, down through a passage here, about 28, about eight verses. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep or died. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one after his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. Now notice what he's going to put an end to. Rule, authority, and power. What power? Not his power. There's other rule. There's other authority. There's other power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he's put all things under his feet. When he says all things are put under him, it's evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. And when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. There's an enemy that is the last enemy, and the Bible says that that last enemy to deal with is death. Death. The rule, the authority, and the power of death. Working against us, working to do its work over us, to influence us, to affect us, and so forth. And that's what we're going to talk about. Death is a spiritual power. 
Death is a spiritual authority. Death has a rule, and God permits it, and it will be the last one to be put down. Let's go to Revelation, the sixth chapter. Look at the eighth verse. He opened the first seal there and in the seventh verse, and he says, And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades, or Hell, followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. Now notice this. We have death that's given the power to bring death. So I want you to see that death is a personality, that death is a principality. Now, a lot of us don't understand principalities and what they are. Hopefully before we get done, we will. But death has a personality. Death rides upon a horse. Death, this death, capital D death, can bring death, lowercase d. And Hades and hell works with death. So where there's death. There's Hades, or hell. Now, how many know Romans 6.23? How many, how many Baptist brethren, ex-Baptist brethren we have here? What's Romans 6.23 say? The wages of sin is death. The payoff of sin, the paycheck of sin, is death. So death has its reward. And like the Lord comes and his reward is with him, when death comes, Death brings his reward, and it's death, <laughs> slavery, bondage. Now, let's go to Psalm 18. There's going to be a lot of Scripture. Psalms 18, but that's how we slay the dragon, Amen. with the word of the Lord. Amen. Psalm 18, verse 4. The psalmist is crying out. He starts out, I, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. Evidently, he's been faltering a little bit. Confesses, God is my strength. <laughs> You've been there, haven't you? I will call upon the Lord, verse 3. Verse 4. The pains of death encompassed me. The floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. Now, death not only has a reward, death comes and surrounds. The psalmist did not say, death came into me, but it said, he encompassed me, he surrounded me, and I felt the pains. And the snares of death confronted me. They didn't snare me, but they confronted me. They were there in front of me, so to speak. And they confront us with fear. See, death, the ultimate problem of all humankind, death, it confronts us every day. It can control us and influence us and even push us away from the Lord, our fear of death. Psalm 116, oh Lord Jesus, help us here today. Let God's people get free. Again, he starts this psalm. <laughs> I love the Lord. <laughs> Sometimes we have to say that to assure ourselves. Lord, I do love you. Verse 3. Listen, when death is coming at you and confronting you, with however it does, you'll start crying your love to God. You're a believer. Verse 3. The pains are the cords of death encompassed me. There again, it surrounded me. And the pains or the distresses of Sheol laid hold of me. In the New King James uh, uh, footnote, it's found me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. Oh, Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul. <laughs> and so death not only rewards and encompasses and surrounds us, it begins to bring distress. It lays hold. It brings trouble. It brings sorrow into our life. The rule of death. Now let's go to Isaiah chapter 28, verse 
Let's read 15. He's talking about the scornful men. But he says, Because you have said, We have made a covenant with death and with Sheol. We are in agreement with the overflowing scourge passing. When the overflowing scourge passes through, it will not come to us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood we have hidden ourselves. It talks about a covenant with death, an agreement, somebody making a, an agreement, a covenant, a marriage with death. See? Falling into agreement with death. Why, I would never do that, Brother Steve. But this thing is so subtle that we're going to begin to see how we can fall into those covenants with this principality. And so, I want you to see this. That when we talk about in the spiritual realm, and one of the things that the Lord's always tried to uh, bring through me is to bring it into the practical realm. How does this manifest in my life? What happens in the kitchen and in the bathroom, in the bedroom, and in the car? That's where it's important to me. See, I, I can have idols in my mind. It manifests in other areas of our life where I turn to other sources besides my God. That's what the idols in my mind cause me to do. And until I stop doing that, I can rebuke the idols in my mind and the spirits and demons in my life all I want to, but I still got to repent and stop it. Or those demons will have rights and grounds to just come right back in and continue to torment me. So, we want to see the practical outworking of this thing. Now, we go back to Deuteronomy, the chapter I read, and we don't need to turn there. Let me just share this with you. He said, therefore choose what? Life. What did he say to do with life? Choose it. Decide for it. Choose life. Now, when we don't choose life, when we just simply fail to choose it and activate our will, we get death. I call this death by default. I simply begin to settle on my leaves. I begin to let up. I begin to get a little less diligent. And out of that, I fail to begin to choose life. I quit gathering and assembling myself together with the saints. I quit praising God. I let my Bible sit for a week. I don't pray in tongues for a week. And every time I default like that, I am choosing death and allowing death to begin to come in and work in my life and in my family. Can you begin to see this? You see nothing else, praise God. We must have a free and active will to choose. Passivity is deadly. And when we think, let things slide and we procrastinate, wherever it be, we invite this principality to come and cast its shadow over everything we do. Now let me tell you, brother. We have got to bring our assemblies into order. I have myself let things slide. I knew they were out of order. I knew they should be corrected, but I said, oh, I don't want to upset. And God showed me, he said, you invite me to death when you don't stand in your prophetic office and do what you're supposed to do. And that's why we stand where we stand right now. Every pastor I'm talking to says, brother, it's dead. Something's happened. I can't, we just, we're just there. And we sing and we lift our hands, but it's missing. And God's expecting us to press on in. And it's going to cost us something, and it's going to be painful, and it's going to hurt feelings. But we've got to, brethren, quit by default letting the spirit of death come and pervade us. Listen to me now. And even though we sing and we praise and God moves, there was a lethargy and a sleepiness. And a heaviness that we had to war against. And it's that principality that's pressing down. And we're going to drive it out of here today. In the name of Jesus. Now, death slips in as a principality, an influence, a shadow. Let's do a little word study here for a minute. Turn to Isaiah 30. 
verse 2. Talking about the rebellious children. Woe to the rebellious children. Verse 2, it says, Who walked down to Egypt. Now, where's Egypt? The world. And who and have not asked my advice to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the what? The shadow of Egypt. The shadow of Egypt. The shadow of Egypt. Now, let's go and, uh, well, just, yeah, let's go to Acts 5, 15. Look at something there. Acts 5, 15. So they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. A shadow. Now, we think about a shadow as something that makes the light darker. But the Bible doesn't think of a shadow that way. A shadow is an influence. And if you're anointed, you walk around like Peter, that influence, is, people are going to feel it. They are going to feel blessed or the demons are going to get stirred up. And for some reason, they're going to say, I don't like that guy. I don't know why, I just don't like him. I'm going to say something. If for some reason you don't like me, you better come see me. Well, I ain't got nothing against you. Well, I hate demons. Praise the Lord. All right. Luke one thirty-five, another passage. Talking about Mary. The Holy Spirit said to her, what? The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. My Lord, what, how to live. To live in that kind of a presence for a moment will make you pregnant. Hallelujah. What's it say in Psalm 23? Even though I pass through the valley of what? The shadow of death. The shadow, the influence, the principality, the power, the authority, the rule, the domain of death. So, I want you to see this. Yes, there are spirits of death that we cast out of people, but we're not talking about casting something out of you. We're talking about you getting out of something. It's one thing to have a spirit of death in you. It's another thing to live in the atmosphere and shadow of death. And it's possible for people to get the spirit of death out of them and to continue to live in the atmosphere of the same death. You see this? A principality is something that dwells in the heavenly, in the second heaven, and it comes down to influence, and it influences us in a pervasive way. It doesn't necessarily live in us. Now, it doesn't have the influence over us if we're free, if there's no lust or other things within us for it to hook into and to get uh, us to, to do something. But nonetheless, it will affect our activity. It will affect the way we think. It will affect our lifestyle. It will affect the kind of house we choose. It will affect the kind of car we drive. It will affect the kind of clothes we wear. And that's wherein a lot of believers are just like the world. They're walking around saying, oh, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. And you'll find out that they're walking under the same styles and lifestyles of the world. We're not free. It's the shadow of Egypt. The shadow of Egypt. We're so afraid to be different. We're so afraid that we're going to be a little odd or peculiar that we run our churches and our ministries in a palatable way, says so this is the way the world does it, this will be the bait that will get them. It never worked in the, in the Bible. Never worked. We've got to become who we are. We'll never change the world until we do. We're the world changers, not them. And we, we let them dictate to us. My God and my Lord. Good, good preaching here. Praise the Lord. Okay. Now, this spirit of death, let me tell you what it does. When it begins to get rain, because, brethren, it's not the things that we've done necessarily. It's the things that we just don't do. It's the things we let slide. It's the things we procrastinate about. And say, well, we'll take care of that sometime. Well, I'll sit down with this person. I'll, I'll, I'll see that the next time that happens, that, that, that doesn't happen. Boy, God's dealt with me. I've been the world's worst procrastinator. Especially when it comes to con confrontations with people. And you know what we'll do? We'll go down to a place like Lake Hamilton and 
and we'll see some things that we don't agree with. We'll go, home. boy, you know, da, 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 da. Instead of saying, Brother Glenn, I've got some art here. Let's talk. And begin to be the stones that rub each other into smooth stones so that we can be in David's pouch. However, the other means we go around arguing all the time. It means we move in love and say, Brother, and, and we'll sit and we'll talk with each other and we call it fellowship and it's not in the light because we're sitting there all the time and we've got something in our heart or in our mind. And we won't deal with it. We won't confront it. We'll let it slide. And death works in that kind of environment. Are you with me? We've got to come out of death. We've got to break the influence of this principality. And only by the, uh, obedience to the Word of God do we choose life. We've got to deliberately choose life. And when Jesus says, if you have your ought with your brother, go to him. When you choose that, you're choosing life. Even though you might lose a friend, if you got a friend in that, you're choosing his life because you're being obedient. Glory to God. But what death does, it comes, see, and it begins to influence us. And you know where we turn? Every time. We turn to the past. When things begin to get a little dry, we start looking back. Oh, I remember. Back when this charismatic thing first started. Oh, listen, boy, you, oh, Brother Bell, it was so good. Oh, I know. I remember our first church in Dallas. Oh, it was so, oh, God, it, let me just go back there. All the praise services. Why, the, the mist was like a fog in there, the presence of the Lord. And, and oh, I just get goosebumps back in Dallas. That's a dangerous, dangerous sign. If you can hear what I'm saying. Because... Satan loves nothing better than to take us out of the now. And the place he always wants to carry us off to is the past. Because I can't have it now. They had it then, but I can't have it now. Maybe someday, but let's go back into the when. And you know, this is hard. And so... He takes us out of the present, ex uh, present experience of God so we won't deal with our sin. Why are we in the shape we're in? Why would things get flat? Why would things get dull? Why would things not work? Oh, brother, it's just the timing of the Lord. Uh, we're waiting on God. I think there's a lot more of God waiting on us than us waiting on God. Now, I know there's a season of things, but brethren... God waits on us to say, okay, deal with your problem. Come on, Gideon, get up out of that hole in the ground and go out there and break up this idol and I'll deliver the people. And he was a fearful man, you know, and God had to deal with him. But God's waiting for Gideon to come out of the hole. We talk about Gideon, Gideon, where Gideon coming? Well, let's come out of the hole then. Well, let's do something. But see, the enemy will take us into the past and we'll get into ancestor worship. And what will happen is we'll forget their sins and their problems and their shortcomings and we'll just worship our ancestors just like they do in the East. Which causes us never have to look in the mirror and say, Oh God, I repent. Wait, in all truth, Lord, it's me. It's me, God. And I'm never going to have anything in Adam. I'm never going to be able to go back and worship my ancestors and talk about what they did and bring anything in God. I'll never do it. There's only one thing we're called to remember. is death. That's why we spread the table. You do show the Lord's death. Till he comes. Do this in remembrance of me. Amen? Oh, brother. You're too far now to get out, I guess. Ecclesiastes, 7th chapter. Now, brother, this is where the old order never makes it because the enemy comes in with this spirit of death and we start thinking about dying we start thinking about retiring we start thinking about those things and we start thinking about our health and we start thinking about our strength and we get pulled back into the past and you'll find out that a lot of times the older people get the more they begin to collect relics and antiques of the past and they don't realize what they're doing 
And instead of saying, in the present moment, like Caleb, my strength is not abated, my eyes are not dim, I take them out. Give me the mouth. Give me the mouth. Give me my inheritance. Give it to me. Give it to me. He had a different spirit. He refused to get old. Because he chose life. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 10. Do not say, Why were the former days better than these? For you do not inquire wisely concerning this. Foolish to look back. And the enemy loves it. And it'll invite the spirit of death. God says, look at the moment I am that I am, Moses. I am. I am. I'm a present God. I'm in the present moment. Today is the day of salvation. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Not yesterday. Now. I'm a now God. I'm a present God. If you can't find God now, you're never going to find Him. And then when we look to the past, you know what we lose? Our hope. Because our hope is in the future. And if I don't have a vision for what's out there that God's promised and prophesied and given to me and laid down in His Word, then I am lost. Because hope deferred makes the heart sick. And that's why we got a lot of sick-hearted people in the kingdom of God. They lost their hope. It's been stolen away by this influence. Now, Ecclesiastes, I mean Ezra 3.10. Can we find it? Brother Tommy's been helping me find a lot of these, a lot of, a lot of these books again. Ezra, three ten. Now that don't, don't look in the minor prophets now, like I just started doing. They were building, rebuilding the temple, and said, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites and the son of Asaph with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for He is good, and His mercy endures forever toward Israel. Hello, Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of the fathers' houses who were old men, who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound was heard afar off. How sad. That I'm so bound up in what God used to do and what God was that I can't enjoy what He is and what He's doing in the present moment. I'm telling you, brethren, I'm learning after my few years in the ministry, some now 24, 24 years altogether. And that doesn't mean anything in the kingdom of God. But I'm learning that the most difficult thing for any of us to do is to pass over. I was sharing last night, I think it was, about those men in the book of Acts that were down there at Ephesus. Paul came in there with that new doctrine about the Holy Ghost, and they hadn't even heard Jesus had come yet. In a matter of five or ten minutes, he took them all the way out of John's baptism of repentance into Jesus and all the way into Pentecost. God, keep me that teachable. Keep me that responsive and that flexible to new truth and to what you're doing. And they didn't even have a Bible. They didn't have a Bible. Oh, they had the Old Testament, but boy, it takes some doing to dig all that out, wouldn't it? But they had a heart after God, and they were able to move. God, let me go on. Let me go on with the I am God, not the I was God. Hallelujah. One work of death is to glorify the past, to change the truth about the past. Funny how mom and papa and grandma and grandma, grandpa get more spiritual and more religious the longer they're dead. That's not going to help us. It's only the truth is going to help us, see? And so, I wrote a note down here. If we talk of the future, but don't want what it takes to bring it, 
But we've got less to do but turn back to the past. Now, what am I saying? God has given us a vision through prophetic preaching. Brother Jack and Brother Tommy and others. Brother Kelly Barnett, who I spent some time with recently, and others that can see it. And I can see it with them. But God, how do we get there? And I believe that's what it means when deliverers, it says deliverers will come out of Mount Zion. We're going to have to stand up and bring order in the house of God. We're going to have to deal with spirits that are in people, that are even in leadership. We're going to have to be brave and bold, and lots of people aren't going to like that. Not going to like it. And yet want it so bad, but not be able to cross over because of the painful cutting of the circumcision that's going to take it to Before we can take Canaan, we've got to go to Gilgal. And it doesn't matter how old I am or how long I put this off. I've got to be cut. Oh, I can't go in. Can you hear me? Who? And who wants to submit to the night? But that's the only way we're going in. And until you've had a prophet sit at your table at your house and point his finger in your nose, and show you that you're sitting in the middle of deception and that you're about to go down the tubes, you won't know what I'm talking about. But I can appreciate it now. And it hurt like hell. But it drove hell out. Because a righteous man loves reproof. And there's nothing better, nothing more glorious, that God loves you enough that if you go so far off that he'll send you a prophet. Not to say, oh, my beloved, how wonderful you are. But to say, if you don't repent, you're going to die. That's love. Might as well say amen, it is. Now, a life surrounded by... Now, here's some signs that you'll see about the spirit of death. Relics, antiques, hand-me-downs, heirlooms. Etc., 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 speaks of death. Junk, disorder, speaks of death. It's death. And all this works just to take the edge off of sin, the edge off of the failure of our ancestors, and the edge off of the present. And I've already said it's like ancestor worship, and it's all under death. And this shadow comes over us, and we don't even realize it. We're sitting there in a light. See, if we turn these lights down slow enough on a real stand, it'd probably take us a half hour before somebody realized, is it getting dimmer in here to you? No, I, why, why? You think it's getting dimmer? Seems to me it's getting dimmer. And see, it's just that subtle. Just that subtle. And pretty soon you start getting a little sleepy, a little groggy. What do you say? Oh, I better get the tape. <laughs> Isaiah 28, 14. I better move on here. This is going to take some time. And it's that same passage that I read a while ago about the covenant with death by default, by omission. It's by what we fail to choose. It's by what we fail not so much to do, brethren, as far as praying more or reading the Bible more or any of those things. It, it's, it's the omission of believing God's Word and standing on it and obeying it more than anything else. Now, go to Isaiah 29, uh, verse 1. Now, look, look at this. Woe to Iriel. To Iriel, the city where David dwelt. Who's Iriel? What's that word mean? It means the Lion of God. It doesn't mean just the Jerusalem, the city of peace. It means the Jerusalem that is the Lion of God. The Lion of God. Now, he's saying, woe to you. Now, why is he saying that? Look in verse 10. For the Lord has poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, namely the prophets, and he's covered your heads, namely the seers. Why? Because of their sin. Because back over in Isaiah 28, they they've made a covenant with death because of their wickedness. And says, look, uh, we're going to get in agreement with death. And death is going to protect us. 
Death is going to save us. And you know what the ultimate outcome of that is? You know what people are doing today? What do they call it? One of them is suicide. What's the other word? I don't want to live. I've got cancer. I'm terminal anyway. Doctor, give me an injection. Euthanasia. That's how far death will go if you let it. And you put that in the spiritual realm now. People are committing spiritual suicide right now. They really are. Because of the influence of the Spirit, there are people that are going to lay down and say, God, I don't want to live. It's too hard. If you're not going to rapture me, let me die. That's euthanasia in the Spirit. It's too hard, God. Woe unto you, Ariel. You lion of God. You lying. What's wrong with you? You ought to be roaring. Death ought to be afraid of you. Don't you know who you are? <laughs> hey, God, I'm preaching to you. I'm, it's going to get in you. We lay down to these things. They slip in on us. They overtake us. And before we know it, see, uh, Re Romans 11, 8. Thank you, Jesus. Set us free, Lord. Romans 11, 8. Just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, they lost their discernment, and ears that they should not hear. They can't hear the word of the Lord. They can't hear the prophetic word. They can't even hear correction to this very day. Why? Disobedience. Refusal. And there it is, a spirit of stupor, a spirit of sleep that comes over the people because they don't choose life. Listen, if you have a prophetic word, if you have a prophetic direction, a prophetic correction, choose it. It's life. Well, I don't know about Brother Jack. I don't know about Brother Tommy. I don't know what Brother Bell's count. I don't know. Let, let, let me go pray about it. You have just chosen by default death. Hear me now. Uh, this, is, this is more critical and important than you would ever think it is as far as God is concerned. Order in the house of God. When this man here, when he says something, because he is the head here, when I say, okay, Brother Glenn, I've chosen life. And when I say, I'll think about it, I don't know, and go off and do whatever I'm going to do, I have by default chosen death. It comes down to things just like that. Because if I can't obey him, who is a visible head, how in the world will I ever obey an invisible one. Now, come on. Let's quit deceiving ourselves. Let's quit deceiving. God gave us visible heads to help us. Not to, not to control us or hinder us. We've all been hurt by that, and that's been designed by the Lord, too. Now, you want to get your eye on the person that hurts you and lick the wound of your hurt, or you want to keep your eye on the first one, your first love. Praise God. All right. Death makes us comfortable because it loves its sleep. And a spirit of stupor, a spirit of sleepiness will come and we'll find us a nice, comfortable place and kind of, you know, crunch into the pillow. And, and he died in his sleep. Now think about this. How seductive death is. Every time that woman came to Samson and says, Oh, tell me. When did she try what he told her? He went to sleep. And finally, the last time, he went to sleep and he woke up and it was gone. Sleeping in the harlot's lap. Well, there's a lot of beautiful harlots around Dallas to sleep with. You can just sleep with them. Come out of there, my people. Don't go lay your head in the harlot's lap until she gets your anointing. Because she's after one thing. She'll tell you she loves you. She tells you she'll wait on you. She tells you how wonderful you are, how anointed you are. But she wants to love you to sleep in her lap so she can get what you've got from God. And then she'll throw you away like a dirty rat. Hear me? It's all over me. And the day is coming. God's going to send his prophets into these whorehouses. 
And we're going to say, come out. I said, Lord, I got a revelation part here already. Praise the Lord. I couldn't believe, I couldn't understand why God was drawing me away from trying to work and establish a church as a pastor and say, I'm going to travel you again. I thought, God, I don't, I, w I want to see a strong church here in the midst of this city. And the Lord spoke to me earlier and said, I'm going to send you out to call my people out. I'm going to send you here and there that they may hear and some will come out. And there will be a gathering of you. There will be. And I don't mean to come to our place. But I mean just come out and get where the elect are and gather with the eagles. Praise the Lord. And so he's going to send us out more. We're going to crisscross and go around the earth. And the message primarily is going to be, come out. Separate yourselves under the Lord. Put away your foreign wives. Hallelujah. Now, and so she got his anointing. He rose up and said, well, bless God, I'll take off again. Uh -huh. I've always been able to just come up out of this hardest lap and take off. And one day you'll wake up and you'll say, I'm gone and you won't be gone. What are you waiting on? I can't believe what some folks do when they've left our church. We've had more leave. Well, they had to come before they could leave. I wish I could keep a roll of the comers and goers. I have a big church. But nine times out of ten, they'll go sleep with the harlot. Oh, you don't understand, I'm wounded. I just want to get somewhere where no one knows me, and I can just praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Oh, she's beautiful. She's seductive. She's lovely. Her, perf she, her bed's perfumed. But her husband's not there. Hmm. Read Proverbs. Psalm 107. I want to get down here for long. Praise you, Jesus. Psalm 107, verse 10. Those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. Now, brethren, you've got to understand that counsel is going to come through flesh and bone. It's going to come through leadership. It's going to come through prophets. Apostles, pastors, and teachers. Therefore, he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down, and there was none to help. And they, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and praise God, he saved them out of their distress. God's always ready to deliver. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death, and broke their chains in pieces. All that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he has broken the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron in two. Now, go to Hebrews, the second chapter. This death that makes us comfortable begins to hold us like we just read. But look here in chapter 2, verse 14 of Hebrews. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and release, look at this now, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. I am so convinced, brethren, that the Passover is more than just talking about the cross. The Passover speaks of the death angel passing over. And when we come under that blood, the death angel must pass over us, and we need not fear death anymore. But too many of us are in bondage because of the fear of death. You run to the doctor with every little ache and pain. You spend your money and, and so many things because you fear underneath that, brethren, is the fear of death. There comes a time where you have to stand and say, God, if you don't heal me, I die. Because I've got to know I'm 53 years old. And before I spend another year in this ministry, I've got to know that my God's faithful and that he is a healer or I can't preach in this place. I've got to know that in my bones and in my flesh. And that nephesh, 
that Tommy was talking about today, that serpent on that stick, you can go see where he is. And you can worship him if you want to. But I know a Yahweh Rapha. Yeah. And his name is healing, and his nature is healing. And brethren, that death angel is not going to have that power over my life. If I die, I die. To be absent from this body is to be present with my Lord. And I'm not going to let the devil control me through the fear of death. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. That's hard. Oh, well, Brother Bill, I know somebody that's all oh, they believe God and they die. Well, I know somebody believes God and they live. You want to compare notes? We just had a man in our church week four last. He'd probably been up here named Ted Rush. Horse fell on him, broke his leg, snapped it right in two, jumped up and said, and fainted. And he said, God's Word said I'm healed. Got to hear the story. Got up and walked around and said, I'm going to ride up. Got back on the horse and rode the horse, got on the motorcycle, rode home, and for three months he walked it out until he had gangrene blisters on his leg. And an angel met him. He's on his way to the VA hospital and said, God, you told me you wouldn't take me beyond that which I could stand. And I, I don't know, I can't stand it anymore. He got on his motorcycle in Beaumont, Texas, on his way to Houston to the VA hospital. And the guy was out there hitchhiking. Turned around his motorcycle to take this guy because he said, asked him where he's going. He said, I'm going to San I mean, to Corpus Christi. He said, well, you can't get there from here. I've got to take you over to him. Put him on the bike. Couldn't feel anybody behind him. but could see a leg. Took him over to this other town and said, now get off here and if you'll hitchhike from here, you can get there. And he says, okay. He said, listen, uh, sir, do you have a dime for a cup of coffee? He said, I reached in my pocket. I had to my name, eight quarters. Reached in my pocket. I let two of them fall through my fingers because I knew I needed to make a phone call when I got to Houston. Handed him to him and said, my name's Ted. And the Lord bless you. And this young man said, my name's Michael. And the Lord bless you. And he was killed right there. Got on his bike, started down the road, looked around. The guy was when he knew. Our God is faithful. Our God is healing. Our God is life. Our God is dependable, reliable, trustworthy. And if we don't know it now, what are we going to do when the horsemen come? God's going to have a people that absolutely believe in Him, that absolutely stand on His Word, that will not be moved, that will stand and call down fire if need be, and will stand and let Him slay Him in the streets if need be. But even after three days, He'll come and get you. Hallelujah to His name. Fear. Death working through fear. 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 1 Corinthians 15, 56. What's the sting of death? Huh? Nope. The sting of death is what? Come on, Bible student. Sin. The sting of death is sin. Now, what does that mean? That means that death comes and in puts an injection. Think of a needle. Think of a needle. Now, think of a, an injection needle. Here comes death. It doesn't come and just pop you. It comes and says, just hold still. It won't hurt. Just be a second. Yeah. And walks off and says, well, that didn't hurt. Nothing happened. Oh, but something did happen. Death got in through that needle. And the needle sent. And you don't even feel it for sometimes for months, for years. But it's there. It's somewhere in your bloodstream. It's locked in a lymph gland somewhere. It's there! And until it's confessed... But the good news is, we've got a remedy. We've got a remedy for the sting of death. Praise the Lord. Because see, what's, what's the rest of that scripture say? Somebody got it? Read it is the law. Now, what's the law demand for sin? Yeah. Death! So the strength of that whole thing is the law. And what's the law? God's Word. 
who's going to bend that? Who's going to change that? Who's going to stop that? So when God says the sentence is dead, hell itself can't stop that. But the blood of Jesus and the name of our Lord can. Bless his name. And we need to start walking in that. We need to start walking in that like we really believe it. We give it lip service. But when are we going to walk it? When are we going to practice it, brethren? Slow death. Just like Adam. Eve, believe it. Thou shalt not surely die. And sure enough, look here, Adam. We, I, we didn't die. Nothing happened. Didn't know how much they died. Didn't know what happened to them. Too. I always think of this in my walk with the Lord. And I have to battle this. I haven't gone to a doctor now in over 14 years. I haven't gone. I made a decision. I said, God, I've come to be almost 49, uh, 39 years old. I've lived a life of hell and depravity and hypocrisy and religion and everything else. It's all or nothing. If I only have two years, God, I'm going to give it all I got for you. All I got. And I'm just going to cast myself upon your mercy totally and completely, 100%. I will not turn anywhere else for my healing, for my finances, Anything. With God, all things are possible, I believe. That's a banner in our church. The enemy comes and says, what if you get something working in your body and you don't know it's there until it's too late? You've heard of these saints, haven't you, brother, that one day, oh, they got it. And then, lo and behold, I get a call from this lady in Florida. We're printing her book. She said, I don't know what happened to my sister. She just loved the Lord so much. She jogged every day. She ate right. She's been living like that for 20 years and said she had a, a, a hemorrhage in her brain and died in 15 seconds. Oh, God. Then I thought, so what? So what? So what? God numbers our days. And if it's a brain hemorrhage or whatever it is, God numbers my days. I'm not going to live with, in that shadow. Praise God. But uh, that thing will come at you soon. So, praise God. Let's, let's, let's wrap this up and let's minister. All right? There's a few other scriptures. Take just a few minutes here. I want you to see this, that we cast demons out, but we also come out of demons. We come out from the influence of principality. And so... Coming out of the house of death. Because death is a house. It's a place. It's an abode. It's a place where you live. And God wants us to come out of that house. See. Go to Ephesians, the fifth chapter. And we'll start coming out of it right now. How many want to come out of death? Amen. Hallelujah. Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 8. Now hear ye the word of the Lord. For you were once darkness. Five, six, no, eight. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, proving what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. We can fellowship darkness. We can fellowship that shadow but rather expose them. Now, now see, we don't just passively say, well, I'm not fellowship it. God says, no, you activate your will and you expose it. Throw the light on it. Your light. Because I'm in you. For it's shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. I had some elders up in Illinois call me one day and said, Brother Steve, you've got to come up here. He said, you know, I already knew the pastor had been in adultery. He'd already come to me with that. But he wouldn't deal with it in the church. Elders called me and said, can you come up here? Well, brother. <laughs> so I called a friend of mine. When, when something that heavy, I like to get another brother. I like to get two are better than one. Safety in a multitude of counsel. Called the brother. And that brother read me that scripture. He said, you know, you're supposed to expose them. So I got on the plane on my own expense. <laughs> through that law, and we unraveled that mess. And we ended up having to close the church. 
Once that thing got exposed, it bombed, it was like a bomb on the whole town. Full gospel business then. God had moved mightily. Linda and I had gone up there. We had mighty, glorious, probably one of the best ministries I've ever seen in any city. Full gospel business then had us, and, and they and people came out of the woodwork that don't even, didn't even know my name. They just came. And boy, it was good. Healings and deliverances and people feel, feel with the spirit, salvation, all, just glory. And Satan came in. So we had to go expose that. You say, well, you lost all that. Never, I've never been back since. The day will come. The day will come, see. Death was dealt with for the sake of the church in that city. Now, I can either save my reputation there and continue my ministry or lay down my life and say, God, for the sake of the saints and the church and your name in this city, we're going to expose this thing and deal with it. You see what I'm saying? These are the things that we've got to begin to do and not wait until some uh, FBI agent or somebody else exposes it for us. Let's deal with our problem and let God heal us. Now, let's go on. Verse 13, But all, the, all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, Awake! You who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Who's he talking to? Sinners? Believers? Wake up! Come out of your death! Get out of Easter! Get out of Christmas! Get out of relics! Get out of idols! Get out of it! And believe God! Hallelujah! Now, light to see. God, we need light to see this. Deal with all unconfessed sin. Break fellowship with unfruitful works and expose them. Unfruitful works, works that you're doing that are unfruitful, expose them for what they are. And I could, I'll not take time to go into detail about that. And then in verse 15 on through verse 21, it talks about your walk. It says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time. Be, don't be unwise. Don't be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, and so on. And then choose life. Do something. Do, do, move. Wake up and walk. Get off it. And get with it, see. And it's not what you're doing that's bad, as I said a while ago. It's what you haven't done. And what did Jesus say the work of a believer was? To believe. To trust. To believe. That's what we're talking about. Believing for healing. Believing for your finances. Believing for your favor. Believing for these things. See, that's our work. And don't be like Lot's wife. Don't look back. Don't be like the elders of Israel and Ezra. Don't cry about the glory of the former house. And then finally, 1 Corinthians, again, 15th chapter. And we're finishing up here. We're going to pray. We're going to see some breakthroughs here. Verse 53. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So then, when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? It won't sting us anymore. And then in Hebrews 10, 22, I'll not read it, but it says, let's draw near. And how do we draw near? Maybe we ought to read it. Let's read it. There's just, there's just two more scriptures. Okay, Hebrews 10, 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Now, the last scripture is in the Song of Solomon, and some of you might remember what that is. But it's a glorious, glorious scripture. It's in the 8th chapter and the 6th verse. For love is as strong as death. Hallelujah. There's our key. There's our key, our love for Him, our love for each other, our love for righteousness, our love for peace, our love for order, our love for obedience, our love for His Word, our love is as strong as death, and it'll defeat this thing. Hallelujah. Glory to His name.
Now, what have we said here? During these lulls of waiting, during these days and seasons when it doesn't seem like God's doing much, it's dangerous time. And it's easy to slip back and to look back and to fall into patterns and let this shadow come over your life. And want to start writing history books and all those things. And God doesn't tell us to do that. We live in the now. We choose life every day. We've got to see that we've got to choose it every day, moment by moment. We're choosing, choosing life. Well, I got saved back. No, you're getting saved. Amen. You're still in the process of choosing life. And when you quit choosing life today, doesn't matter when you got saved, you just lost something. And the spirit of death will come, and it cannot destroy you because you're the Lord, and He has numbered your day, but it can certainly cast its shadow over you, and you can live in the house of death and be a Christian. And God wants us free of that. What are the symptoms of this? Look around you. What have you got around you? Are you surrounded with junk and clutter, things of the past, pictures, books, family heirlooms, relics? I'm telling you. What do you have in you? Depression? You fight depression? You fight sleepiness? Go to sleep in church? Go to sleep in the word when the Word of God's being preached? You got infirmities in your body, you got heaviness, restlessness, coldness for the Lord, lack of energy. All these speak of a spirit of death influencing your life. I put down trance. I've noticed a lot of times in services people have just stared. And you'll find out that it's hard for them to receive sometimes because they get off in these kind of trance, many trances and staring. Uh, this thing's working, see. Uh, passivity, procrastination, indecisiveness, uh, not, not being able to really choose, you know, uh, uh, speaks of this death, confusion, tardiness, always being late. You find a bunch of people and you say, well, charismatics are that way, or uh, some cultures are that way. It speaks of a spirit of death, that inability to act and be decisive and move on things. Uh, you've got this principality pressing down on you, hopelessness. Is a big one, see. You begin to lose hope. You begin to lose your vision. Loss of vision, see. That death will come and shadow it over and dim it. Cut off the flow. It comes and constricts and cuts off the flow. And we got heart attack. We got cancer that comes out of this spirit. You can see it on people. Uh, a spirit, I, I don't know how to name it, except can't be taken care of by God. We've made some decisions, see, that... God can't take care of that. When a horse falls on your leg and the bone's broken right in two, uh-uh. <laughs> God can't take care of that. My Bible says God, with God all things are possible. Better obey God. If God says go get it, splint it and put it in the cast, you do it. You obey God. But don't ever believe he can't take care of it. Don't ever buy that line. But I wonder how many of us have got things working in our mind right now that somehow or another, by default, we've decided God can't take care of that. I'm going to have to do something about that. Now, there are things that God wants us to do. But we've got to let Him take care of it. You follow me? It's time to make some decisions and act on them and step out in God. The greatest blessings I've ever had in my life is when I obeyed God, no matter how hard it was or how scared I was when I did it. I remember the right here in this place, I was sitting right where Brother Jack is, about here, and Brother Kelly Varner was standing right up here in the morning, and he had blown it the night before. And God told me, of all people, to correct him. I'll never forget it. I was, I was shaken. I couldn't even hold my Bible because the Lord gave me a scripture out of Job. We're still friends. Still love each other. But I obeyed God, and after it's all over, I was blessed. Now, Brother Glenn, I really believe God's, gonna, God's putting a new anointing on you for authority and leadership and order in the camp. 
It's going to be people coming in here. And you don't have to, every time, bless God that we're here, say, Brother Jack or Brother Tommy or Brother Steve, Brother, you stand up and say, in the name of Jesus. I really believe God wants to put that on you in a new anointing, brother. I mean a courage and a strength and an authority in the name of Jesus to stand and see that there's order in the house of God. Praise the Lord. And this man is the leader here, and his word is the word of the Lord to us. Hallelujah. And you don't have to say, well, I'm not a prophet or I'm not this or that. God put you here. God put this in your hands, brother. And you stand and say, look, it's going to be this way. And we're all going to agree with this. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. And when he says sing this song or don't sing that song, bless God, shut it down and do what he says. And God will bless that. Obedience and order in the house of God. And we'll drive the spirit of death out by choosing life. And it comes in obedience. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands if you want to live. You know what Jezebel's problem always is? She's in a sick bed. Why is she sick? Because she hasn't chosen life. She won't submit. She won't take instruction. She won't take orders. She's got her own anointing. And it's the depths of Satan. Sounds like God. It comes out of the Bible. It preaches and prophesies. But it's death, and all her children die. Her ministry is a ministration of death. We've got to do it God's way. Whether we like it or not, whether it's logical or not, whether it's powerful or not, whether it's vulgar or not, we've got to do it God's way. And we'll have life. We'll have life. We'll have life. But if we don't, brethren, if we start to slide and draw back, and ease up, instead of pressing in, that shadow will come over us, and God will bring another generation to see if they'll do it. But He'll have a generation. And I have, in all my heart, and all my strength, and all my life, I said, God, let me be one of those. I shared with my people, I said, the many times that I've wanted a word from God. Have you ever wanted a word from God? Come to me and say, Boy, I hope Brother Jack can see me. Oh, God, some of you sitting here right now. Oh, if I just get it. And I've been there. I've been there. I've been there. I thought, Oh, God, I just, I can't. Oh, Lord, just give us a word. Lynn and I prayed. Sometimes when I got the word, I didn't like it. But... And I said, I said, Lord, where's a man that I could go to that I, that I just trusted and and then he would give me that word that he was, he was just pure and, and really with him. You know what God's answer was? He said, you be that man. You be that man. Oh, God. He said, God, in your strength and help, I'm on my way. Let's pray. Don't bow your heads. Don't close your eyes. Look at me. Wake up! <laughs> I know I've been screaming, but I, I, I know what's going on here. I'm doing warfare. I know what's going on. I've done this before, but not quite like here. I, I was fighting a little fear. I don't know why, but I know that the thing that's coming at us here. Look, when Jesus prayed over the fish and the loaves, what did he do? Lifted his eyes up and said, Oh, Father! He didn't bow his head and close his eyes at all. He looked, Yes, Lord. <laughs> no, yes, Lord. We're going to have to start seeing what's going on in the house of God. I found out sitting up there on the platform sometimes I keep my eyes open. I see all kinds of stuff that I didn't know was going on. <laughs> Let's rebuke this spirit of death. Now, listen to me. You're going to have to make some decisions. It's not just us praying here. It's some decisions you make that when you go home, that you take care of some things. That you make some quality decisions, as they call it. And you take care of some things. You, you clean up your house, so to speak. You clean out your house, so to speak. 
And you'll be surprised what that little bit of obedience will do. That little book, No Other Gods, wrote back there. Boy, people get, I get phone calls every once in a while. Boy, on my answering machine, you know, this is human. You know, I want to talk to you. Well, I, I don't call them back. Why should I do that? You know? I don't like to use them, but I, I, we can't answer the phone 24 hours a day. You know, we just can't do it. But I know the miracles I've seen when people have acted on what to the carnal mind is so foolish. Don't understand it. But I just know that these spirits can attach themselves and influence our lives by things we have. And I know the spirit of death. I know what it hangs on to. I've, I've walked in those homes that are full. Now, I know this is somebody's golden cow. But I'm telling you, I can't stand antiques. can't stand them. They speak of death. I've walked in those houses that are full of them, and all I can smell is death. Give me a plastic tablecloth. Give me a nice metal chair, praise God, that's up to date, that fits my back better anyway. And let's live in the now. How many of you here have got some kind of infirmity or something in your body today? That's the work of death. We're going to pray for you, too. But right now, I know it's getting late. Let's just come against the spirit of death. Get in agreement with him. Say this. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ I stand against death. I bind you, death. I rebuke you. I break and loose myself from all your influence over my life, my health, my finances, my family, my possessions, and everything about me. You leave in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am bought by the blood. Death, you have no more influence over me. From this moment on, for I choose life, I choose to obey God's Word. I am an obedient servant of the living God. I choose to live in the now. I put the past behind me. I renounce the past. And I look to the present moment, to the I am living God. And grab hold of the hope that He's put within me. That is the anchor of my soul. Thank you, Lord, for my future. Thank you that every prophecy will come true. That's been spoken over me by a true prophet or any other true prophetic word. I thank you for it. And I believe it. And I receive it. And because I believe the prophets, I shall prosper. Thank you for life, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's just praise Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. I'm alive. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Now, hold it. Hold it a minute. I don't want, I don't want to quench the spirit. But we're going to come against the spirit of death that's tried to come and shadow this camp. And together we're going to do it. We're going to break. There's going to be a turning point today. There's going to be a whole new campground here. I'm not saying that it hadn't been good. As I said, my roots are here. And I love this place. I love this place. I, you don't know how much that Linda and I love this place. But God's getting ready to, for a new beginning. I believe it in all my heart. It's put it in my heart. I don't know when anybody sees it or not. But something's going to change and break. And we haven't seen yet what God's plans are for this place. It's going to be glorious. Yeah, we're going to come more often. I, you know, I, I know it. God spoke to me and said, you're going, to, you're going to be coming up here more often? There's going to be work to do. That doesn't mean I've got to be up here teaching and preaching all the time. There's going to be people needing help. Hallelujah. We're going to have teams and so forth. I, I'm not going to get into all that. But let's just come against that spirit of death. Now say, in the name of Jesus, name of Jesus you, wicked you wicked spirit of death, death and hell, death and hell. We, rebuke we rebuke you. You leave these grounds. You leave these we break the hold of your influence. We, we command your shadow removed. We shadow and we lose, we lose light and life. In Jesus' name, in Jesus let there be a spirit of hope, Lord. We lose the spirit of hope. 
They lose the spirit of the anointing. That it shall increase and increase until it's double what it's ever known before. That the yoke may be broken in Jesus' name. Death and hell go now and do not return in Jesus' name. Amen. Now praise Him some more. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Glory to your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to your name. Now just stay right with me for a minute. I know it's late, but let's let's finish up here now. You spirits of depression. No, no, don't don't repeat this. You just receive this. Just don't pray right now. Just be open and let these things leave. I come against the spirits right now of depression and heaviness to leave everyone in this place that you're in. Come out now. We cast you out in Jesus' name. All depression and heaviness in Jesus' name. Leave now. Leave now. Heaviness in Jesus' name. For God has not given us a spirit of heaviness in Jesus' name. Now you get out, you foul spirits. Fear of death, you go. Fear of death, you go. In the name of Jesus. I'm going to stop. I, the Lord's saying stop to get into this later. I'm going to obey the Lord. I, I, I'm, I, I got off track there. Okay? We've done what we're supposed to do right now. All right? And then we'll follow up in following ministry. We'll start coming against these things. We'll pray for uh, deliverance and, and infirmity. Now begin to believe God. Listen, let that hope rise up in you. Your healing's here. Your healing's here. Be healed before you leave this campground. Amen? Your deliverance is here. You're going to walk out of here freer and more liberty than you've ever known in your life. Amen? Praise God. Okay, I'm done. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home.